Pakistanis have gone to the polls in a critically important election. What will be left of their democracy? With the army pulling the strings behind the scenes, not much. Committing atrocities in Gaza, incriminating themselves online. Do Israeli soldiers not care that the ICJ is watching? And a commanding presence whose words fall flat. The White House spokesman tasked with defending an indefensible war. With more than 60 countries going to the polls in 2024, we are now one month into the year of the election. We begin with the one in Pakistan, where this week's vote did not go according to plan. It was meant to be a formality, the outcome predetermined. The Pakistani military and intelligence apparatus, referred to across the media there as the establishment, had made its preferences clear and marginalized candidates it opposed, namely former Prime Minister Imran Khan. The media had their marching orders. Anchors shied away from mentioning Khan's name on the air. But the establishment encountered a problem. Khan and his party, the PTI, remained popular with the people, and the early returns reflected that. For all their managing of the narrative and meddling with the politics, the powers lurking behind the scenes in Pakistan underestimated the PTI's popularity with the electorate. And what has followed is chaos. Three days before Pakistanis went to the polls came this prediction, one that would prove prophetic, on what would happen if voters failed to back Nawaz Sharif, the candidate of the powers that be, and voted for Imran Khan instead. That is exactly what happened. Once the first wave of returns showing candidates affiliated with Khan were leading, the next wave of results slowed to a trickle. The Election Commission's official website suddenly went down on election night. Pakistanis tuned into their news channels were watching their democracy being managed in real time. This election was hardly an election. I think the right word for this was as a predetermined selection. The military establishment had expected that they would be able to control the results. Within two to three hours, it became obvious that Imran Khan's party was sweeping the elections. So the military took control of the election commission and has manufactured a totally new election results. Pakistanis have always had to read between the lines in the reporting and decipher coded language from news outlets wary of angering the authorities. They use cryptic terms like the establishment for the institutions that have almost always held the real power behind the scenes, the army and the intelligence agency, the ISI. Such language was deployed throughout the election campaign, delivered with a chuckle at times, like a joke that everyone is in on. The establishment tried hard to tilt the playing field against the former Prime Minister, Imran Khan, the country's most popular national leader, and his party, the PTI. The PTI was officially banned from the ballot. Party candidates were forced to run as independents. Then, just a week prior to the vote, Khan was sentenced to more than 30 years in jail on corruption charges and dubious allegations that he had an un-Islamic marriage. The establishment thought it had managed to make Khan and his party unelectable. The results of the vote, at least the early returns, proved otherwise. In many ways, Imran Khan's story is a story of both continuity and a story of disruption. Imran Khan's story of continuity, what is that? That's because every prime minister in Pakistan who's tried to assert civilian authority eventually uh, comes up against the military establishment uh, and he is, you know, um, shown the door, ousted out of power in whichever way um, is deemed fit. 
Uh, but Imran Khan's story is also a story of disruption uh, because he's been able to tap into a sentiment within Pakistan uh, and that personality cult has meant that he's retained uh, his hold on the public imagination and is uh, now actually given as an example or a lesson of how to sort of tap into uh, the demographic, uh, the youth uh, and young people as well, and who are obviously key voters. But I think also it's a, it's a one way of describing his uh, political party because it is around the personality of Imran Khan, uh, the myth and the legend is that uh, it's not Pakistan Tariq Insaf, it's actually Pakistan Tariq Imran. When Imran Khan was first elected in 2018, he didn't really take power. He shared it with the establishment, as other prime ministers have had to do in what Pakistanis call their hybrid regimes. The former cricket player played ball with the military until 2021, when he clashed with army chiefs over who should lead the intelligence agency. By 2022, he was out of office. Then Khan went after the establishment, shattering taboos by naming and shaming army heads, setting himself on a collision course with the security apparatus, effectively sealing his own political fate. I think this is also a very simplistic way of looking at it. Mr. Imran Khan, he may have um, peddled the kind of narrative which has made him uh, a very popular leader in Pakistan. But he's committed a long list of mistakes both while he was in power from 2018 uh, till, uh, till he was thrown out in 2022 in the vote of no confidence and even afterwards. So for example, he peddled this theory about some very large scale conspiracy in which the United States was involved with the opposition parties in Pakistan to throw him out because he has a large support base, uh, he was able to whip up a lot of frenzy. But then, obviously, the next thing happened, which is that he was slapped with a lot of court cases. I heard reports, people who attended a meeting with intelligence, and the message was very clearly delivered that you cannot say Imran Khan's name on mainstream television. So um, the Pakistani media had many amusing ways of referring to Imran Khan. It was always some kind of metaphor, uh, describing him as um, Suleiman's father, his, his, that's his son's name. Anchors were used to saying Imran Khan very easily, or Khan. And then you suddenly see that they had to stop themselves. Because Makil Abdul Razak Sahib, they gave Imran Khan Sahib, forgive me, they gave Chairman Tariqa Sahib. Leery of the compromises their mainstream media operate under, supporters of Khan and the PTI flocked to YouTube social media and elsewhere online to get their news. Khan's own YouTube account has been key to his party's messaging, as have bloggers backing the PTI, spreading the word virally. Those platforms have also attracted the attention of the establishment. Imran Riaz Khan, no relation, is a cautionary case in point, one of them. A broadcast journalist, Imran Riaz, worked for mainstream news channels until 2020, before migrating to YouTube, where he has more than 4 million subscribers. In 2023, after Imran Khan supporters attacked military installations, Imran Riaz was arrested for a third time and disappeared for four months. Police and other officials denied knowing of his whereabouts. He came out of it clearly damaged. His case served as a warning to Pakistani journalists working online. Imran Riaz Khan was twice abducted and picked up illegally. Uh, he spent months in solitary confinement. Uh, he came back in a very bad shape. There were others abused, beaten and assaulted on the roadside. A very prominent television anchor person, uh, a colleague of mine, Arshad, was uh, chased in Dubai. He was forced to leave Dubai. He took shelter in Kenya where he was gunned down. All the elements of his murder found within Pakistan. And then the threats, the midnight calls. I was called many times in the middle of the night. This is how I was forced to leave Pakistan after uh, Shaheed Arshad Sharif's uh, murder. Media under threat is a reality which is connected to the um, the, the kind of power structure that we have here in Pakistan. Does the threat come from the establishment? There are no two ways about it. 
Does it come from civilian governments? Of course it does. There have been a long line of people in Pakistan who've held very high offices, both civil and military, who've had very little tolerance for freedom of expression and who've resorted to all kinds of pressures, both violent and non-violent, to try and clamp down on the media. So, unfortunately, the reality is that Pakistani media continues to live under a threat. This is the stage of the story where we sometimes turn to the lessons to be learned or how things are likely to change, except almost no one in Pakistan sees it that way. Despite the glaring slowing down of the vote count, the clear interference of the Elections Commission in the electoral outcome, it comes as no surprise to Pakistanis that there was Nawaz Sharif the day after an election he appeared to have lost, making what his party called a victory speech. Pakistan Muslim League noon sabse badi jamaat ban ke ubri hai. Leaving Pakistanis to face the fact, the incontestable, well-established fact, that theirs is a democracy in name only. There's a phrase that Pakistanis use a lot, which is, sabko pata hai hai. everybody knows. Everybody knows who's behind it, despite uh, all that's happened to, uh, to Imran Khan and the Pakistan that he gains off, is that they've demonstrated that they know what's happening, and demonstrated through the power of the vote, and that disconnect between the people and the military establishment is something that the military establishment should deeply think about. Maybe it doesn't even matter because there are no consequences. Turning to Gaza now, it's been two weeks since the International Court of Justice concluded that Israel may be committing a genocide there. Yet that seems to have had little effect on Israeli soldiers who continue to commit crimes against Palestinians and post the evidence online. Tarek Nafa is here with more. Richard, evidence of war crimes is being uploaded online by Israeli soldiers almost every day. This image of a Palestinian man stripped, bleeding and tied down prompted outrage this week. The man behind the photo goes by the name Yossi Gamzu Latova. He's a photographer in the Israeli military who uploaded the picture to Facebook and he clearly wasn't ashamed of it. That's his mobile number at the bottom of the image. After it went viral, Latova locked his Facebook account, but we managed to catch a glimpse of his profile before he did. It included pictures of his unit occupying Palestinian homes, homes they've destroyed, while taking trophy photos. Latova is also responsible for this video from December, which showed captive Palestinian men and boys being paraded half naked at a football pitch. Material like that is all over Facebook and TikTok, uploaded by Israeli soldiers. And this past week, the Israeli military came clean about a Telegram channel it now admits it created, called 72 Virgins Uncensored. It proudly posted, among other things, photos of desecrated Palestinian bodies. Whether it's coming from soldiers, individuals, or the Israeli military, Documenting abuse and destruction in Gaza is part of a celebratory culture of violence against Palestinians that exists in Israeli society. <laughs> Soldiers are all too comfortable sharing evidence of their own war crimes because they do not fear the consequences, even with the ongoing ICJ investigation. They know from experience that they won't be held accountable. Thanks, Tarek. For Israel's primary backer in its war on Gaza, the United States, getting the messaging right has not been easy. And the Israelis haven't helped, not with the imagery their soldiers have been sending from the war zone or the genocidal statements that many of their politicians have made. That's put the Netanyahu government at odds with the Biden administration behind the scenes. In public, in the middle of it all, stands the U.S. National Security Council spokesperson, John Kirby. The White House podium has not been an easy place for him, not recently. We have seen some uncomfortable exchanges with reporters that have made their way into news broadcasts, viral clips online, and even GIFs. Kirby has maintained an aggressive approach in his delivery. Whether audiences believe him or not is another matter. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on John Kirby and the challenge of selling a message that fewer and fewer people are buying.
I have John Kirby here. The Admiral is here to give an update on what's happening in the Middle East and take any foreign policy questions you may have. In the career of any senior Washington spokesperson, nothing turns up the intensity quite like a war. For the man who has been behind the podium in the White House press briefing room through the Gaza war, retired Admiral John Kirby, the global spotlight has been sharp. John Kirby. In Washington, the national security spokesman there, John Kirby, said he I take it pers as a personal insult. Mm. Mr. Kirby would just stand there on the podium of the White House and say, meritless, counterproductive, baseless, forget about it. His job in this role is to keep things from escalating. He does a pretty good job of staying on message, but more so, his job is not to further inflame. I am not going to address this issue from this podium. I'm just not going to do it. It's a hard job, especially now, with the way um, communication flows. And the policy positions Kirby has to justify also make the job hard, such as when he called the genocide case brought against Israel at the International Court of Justice. Meritless, counterproductive, and uh, completely without any basis in fact whatsoever. Kirby continued being dismissive of the case during the week of the hearing at The Hague. There is no basis for um, accusations of, of genocide against, against Israel. That's not a word that ought to be thrown around lightly. And we certainly don't believe that it applies here. By the end of the month, the ICJ made its disagreement with that assessment clear, ordering by a margin of 15 judges to two that Israel must, quote, prevent genocidal violence by its armed forces. Israeli forces have killed thousands, hundreds of thousands of people at risk of starvation, um, who are displaced. So by that magnitude alone, one can intuit that there is some form of mass human rights issue here. By dismissing this claim of genocide, it allows Mr. Kirby and other administration officials to sort of then work around confronting and addressing the fact that there is so much mass-scale misery that the United States might be actively complicit in. The Biden administration has three primary messengers putting out the U.S.'s official line on what's happening in Israel's war on Gaza. There are the State Department representatives, the White House press secretary, and John Kirby, whose title is Coordinator for Strategic Communications at the National Security Council but who speaks from the podium at the White House. Kirby and other spokespeople are operating in a media climate where challenges can come not just from journalists in press rooms or news studios, but from the material reporters trapped in Gaza are putting out. Their videos have flooded social media and have even jumped into mainstream news reporting. Tonight, News at 10 has evidence of a group of unarmed Palestinians coming under fire. One of the group was hit and fatally wounded as our cameraman filmed. Carry him. They've killed him, yells this youth. Then suddenly, more gunfire. That ITV report was brought up at a State Department briefing. The spokesman had to claim, in essence, that he couldn't see what everyone else who saw the report could. I have seen the, the, that footage, um, but uh, I uh, am not going to uh, comment on the specifics around that, given I'm not aware of the full circumstances on the ground. Dodging difficult questions, evading evidence that conflicts with U.S. positions, it's part of any spokesperson's job. For Kirby and the others, they are doing that work as approval of the U.S.'s handling of Israel's war on Gaza nosedives. U.S. policy toward Gaza is not overwhelmingly popular in the United States. Polling shows that there's a tremendous number of people who are very ill at ease. CBS News poll is showing most Americans disapprove of President Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. And, uh, there are mass demonstrations in the United States. There are about close to 60 members of Congress who've called for a ceasefire. Uh, four U.S. senators have done the same. And so while well, Kirby has tremendous strengths as a communicator, there, I think, is some question about whether his enthusiasm for the administration's position goes over as well, as opposed to one that is a little more nuanced and in touch with the, the real debate that's going on in the United States. 
nuance is not something Washington spokespeople are known for. However, within DC circles, Kirby's lack of it hasn't been of any detriment to his reputation. Two months into the war on Gaza, the Washington Post, the paper considered a must read in the US Capitol, put out this fawning piece about Kirby. The headline talked up his commanding presence, and yet fewer and fewer Americans are buying the administration's message. By and large, media coverage of Israel-Palestine relations in the United States has been uh, at best mixed and often very poorly done. You see a reflection of administration policy and insider foreign policy consensus rather than a reflection of the real and whole debate. And so it's not overly surprising that you've got folks at the Washington Post saying Kirby's a commanding presence and he's very impressive and, and all these things. But one core question you might ask is, is he effective? The notion that this White House has convinced the American people that its approach to Gaza is the right one, I mean, that's very much up for debate. There are a few things that make a senior spokesperson for any administration successful. One is, of course, just institutional knowledge. Another aspect is just experience. He not only was doing communications and press for the Pentagon, the State Department, the Navy, he as well had a stint on CNN as a security analyst. Joining me now is retired Rear Admiral John Kirby, CNN military analyst. For so he's built up a lot of goodwill both with the press corps and with those who kind of see this man as a respectable voice on these issues. Hamas deliberately shelters themselves inside yes. residential buildings, hospitals and schools, yes. basically on purpose, putting civilians in the line of fire. And what Israel's trying to do is get them out of the line of fire. So the influence Kirby has with the media has had an impact on mainstream reporting on the Gaza war in the US. Kirby teared up on the air in the days after the Hamas attack on Israel. But I've never seen anything like this. I, uh, it, I'm sorry, it's, it's very, excuse me, very difficult to look at these images, Jake. He hasn't succumbed to such emotion over civilian deaths in Gaza and has even contested the notion that the Israeli army might be targeting Palestinian journalists. Your question presumes that they are deliberately, maliciously going out to kill journalists, and I've seen, we've seen no indication that they have done that. The U.S. will always start at a place where they're pro-Israel. His response was, they have no hard evidence that that is happening. And, and keep in mind, lying is different from just controlling the flow of information, which is very important, especially in a situation like this, where there's a lot at stake, emotions are high, there's a lot happening that on the ground that most civilians are not aware of, at least not its totality. For the four months that the war in Gaza has blazed on, John Kirby has been steadfast at the podium and in new studios. Footage of hospitals under siege have not pushed him off message. Evidence of mass starvation has not altered his talking points. Even the Israeli government's blatant counter-messaging to the U.S.'s statements of diplomacy have not shaken Kirby's line of argument. For some, Kirby's message discipline is admirable. For many others horrified by the brutality in Gaza, the dogged support of Israel's methods of war is unforgivable. Kirby's numerous sound bites have been recorded for posterity, and they will remain for history to judge. We close where we started, with 2024, the year of the election. There are another 53 to come all over the world, culminating in the U.S. presidential vote in November. In many of those elections, like Pakistan's, the mainstream media will play a central role, affecting outcomes at times and not always for the better. We'll be tracking those stories, examining the journalism and the effect that news coverage can have on democracies everywhere, here at The Listening Post.